Crossroads Media. What is going on, everyone? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads. If you live under a rock, John Clark has a podcast with NBC Sports called The Takeoff. And Dave Dombrowski was on his show discussing the Philadelphia Phillies. I have a lot of bullet points that I want to get into and expand on when assessing where we are right now, winning baseball games. That's where we are, damn it. We are in a spot where we where we watch consistent good baseball over the last handful of series, and I truly don't know how to operate, but I am doing my best to live as a Samaritan and somebody in society. You know, so many individuals claim there's nothing on TV tonight with Philadelphia sports. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. That is not true. The New York Mets are in action in Cincinnati. That is a Philadelphia sporting event. You need to be tuned in on what's happening in New York. You need to be watching the rest of the NL East, although we really believe the Nationals are bums now, and we watched John Lester hit a bomb tonight. I love watching around the league. Another tilt that's going to be incredible is you have yourself the Dodgers versus the Giants at 10 o'clock on the West Coast with my MLB TV app. So you bet your ass I'm not missing a damn pitch of that action. I don't know how I got to this point, and I forgot that I needed to mention a couple things. So I guess this is going to be my time on where I do this. Okay, so we are ready to hit a milestone in two different areas. On my personal Twitter page, at Broads81, we are extremely close to 6,000 followers. I would say it's an entertaining follow. I would say you will enjoy it during games, and even when it's not game time, I'm tweeting away as well. So make sure you follow me there. And also on YouTube here, at Broads Media, we are inching our way closer to 18,000 subscribers. So... If you are new to the channel, make sure you smash that and, of course, the thumbs up button also. And and now that we got that out of the way, let's dive into some of the things that were mentioned by Dave Dombrowski. So we'll kind of just go in order as the conversation kind of happened and the intriguing things. He basically started off with, with saying something about we're in this and we're going to try and make our club better Over this time period, there were questions about selling, questions about winning. We really didn't need the confirmation from Dave Dombrowski, but, you know, he does come out and say, look, we have a chance to compete. And he was in other cities before. He understands, get in, have a chance to compete. Now, let's not fool ourselves. They're not in the NHL. The NHL, you can win a championship and win the Stanley Cup as an eighth seed. In Major League Baseball, let's not go overboard here. Let's not try and fool people. We're not clowns. That's not necessarily totally true, but here's what I do know. We have been deprived of playoff baseball for so damn long to the point where I honestly do not even remember what it's like. I truly do not remember the emotions that run through my body for playoff baseball. I've seen playoff hockey with the Flyers, not this past season, but the previous season. They were one game away from the Eastern Conference Finals. While the Sixers piss us off and we're so damn frustrated with them, we're frustrated with them because they're not going deep enough in the playoffs, but we see playoff basketball every single season. I don't know what it's like. I forget I forget what it's like to sit there pitch by pitch with meaningful baseball in South Philadelphia. It's disturbing. It, it's something that I, I think about every day. I wake up and I'm getting my coffee together for coffee with Broads. What's running through my mind is Zach Wheeler inning two, Citizens Bank Park, huge game, and he's starting to deal. And you see the slider combination with the fastball. You're seeing swings and misses out of the zone because the hitters are fooled. They think it's cheese coming. Oh, what's that? Oh, they're going fishing for something five feet off the dish. Uh, You know, that's what I think about every day. So there is this middle ground, this middle game, I guess, if you will, when it comes to what Dave Dombrowski 
sees and what he's going to do moving forward with this push. I know I claimed I'm going to go in order in the conversation flow with John Clark and Dave Dabrowski, but I'm already taking that back because that does segue into talking about Mick Abel. Now, I don't know what Mick Abel is going to be. And of course, the guy that they drafted in Painter, there's high expectations for him as well, Andrew Painter. And there was somewhat of a comp between... Mick Abel and himself. So I'm interested to see, you know, how both of these prospects play out. But my point is this. He says you have to be reasonable with where you are. Never is he going to look to trade Mick Abel. He could be a number one down the road. Now, I know that Dave Dombrowski just got here. So it's unfair to apply the system of the Phillies organization and the lack of development on him with that said, though, I, I heard the same thing about Spencer Howard. I heard the same thing about a lot of these prospects. J.P. Crawford was another name, and he ended up, you know, leaving town before we got to know anything about J.P. Crawford. We've heard so much about these players that should be performing at a high level, and they're so great. Well, just prove it to me. That's all. I'm not claiming he can't be. By no means am I saying Mick Abel is going to be a horrendous pitcher. All I'm saying is the track record of this franchise franchise concerns me, so I'll wait for him to prove to me that his repertoire can be sensational. Where I'm going with this, the tie to the Dave Dombrowski angle, though, is you don't just give up everything right now because you're you're sniffing a couple games back of the New York Mets in a disastrous NL East. You don't go all in and sell all your chips and push all your chips. There's times when that is the time. There's times when that is the time? No, no, no. There is is time when that's the right move. Let's put all of our chips and go all in and bet on this one player or maybe two players to come in and get you over the hump to bring home the commissioner's trophy back to Philadelphia. You're not even close, though, to that time. So let's not go overboard with the type of assets that you can bring in. Although with me saying that, I was a little shocked to see how heavily involved Dave Dombrowski possibly is on Craig Kimbrough. I thought to an extent, maybe it would be too much. He's the hot item. He's the one that a lot of teams want on the market. And keep in mind, he can fill the hole for not only this season, but next year as well which is great for the Phillies if they can land him. But I'm saying it's now more when it's the cost factor, when you're thinking about how much you are willing to give up. And I know what everybody's thinking right now. Who in the world do the Phillies have prospect-wise that will intrigue other organizations? In terms of Kimball, you're probably going to find a better suitor. You're probably going to find someone who can outbid the Phillies. When you think of the Rodriguez of the world, when you look at other closers and other back end of the bullpen pieces where organizations realize they are going to lose those players and they're just going to try to acquire anything they possibly can, there are guys that don't have elite ceilings that when you talk about a reliever that's no longer going to be on that team for next season, those are the type of prospects, the mid-level type of players, the, the, the really high reward, but nowhere even close to, to doing anything type of thing. Like, uh, you know, he, he can be this. All right, it's a long shot, but he can be this. But we'll take a flyer on him because it's just a relief pitcher that we're going to be losing anyway. You know, those type of prospects do exist, and that is something that Dave Dombrowski can handle when thinking about bringing in players that are not necessarily the Martes of the world, the Bruxtons of the world, and the Craig Kimbrels of the world. But I'm excited to see because Dave Dombrowski Dombrowski has his foot on the gas pedal. This is no joke. This is no Matt Klentak and Andy McPhail anymore. He's been around the block. He's made these type of moves in the past. He's been a part of organizations that made some big time pushes and were built for a decent stretch of time based off of him. Sometimes not, but sometimes based off of him, him being the ones to push all the right buttons in Detroit, and, and that's crucial. So I trust Dave Dombrowski. I'm watching the Flyers right now be in the mix for Vladimir Tarasenko. They make a push for Ryan Ellis, and here's Dave Dombrowski. Who, what, I, what I sense is urgency. I see that he's got the killer eyes right now, knowing I can make this work, baby. I can make this work. I'm not 100% in because they need to be reasonable, 
But I can make this work. I can get creative and I can start moving some pieces to get some beneficial players on this team. And, and I'm definitely very intrigued by him. So if you've been listening to me for a little bit of time and, and looking at my tweets as well, I've been going crazy about this luck in baseball thing, right? And I'm not going to push it even more. I'm not going to go heavily, heavily into it. I just want to touch on it, though, because what was stated was we legitimately have a chance to win. We have to do the little things right. We have to advance runners. We have to get runners in from third base, cut down on the strikeouts, make routine plays, routine plays from a defensive perspective. Now, what has been discussed in this recent time is how the singles have just been irrelevant to people. A single now is basically you got lucky. That's how it's framed. And I try to stress to individuals and people that did not understand what I was saying and the ones that did understand what I was saying but just decided to fight back because maybe they disagreed and I'm totally okay with that as long as you support your logic and you give detailed information on why you feel the way that you do and you back it up with logic. That's all I ask for. You can feel any way, but I want to see statistics and data to show why you feel the way that you feel. So for the ones out there, it's it's a part of the game, and it's a mindset, and it's a way to win. If you play small ball and you put together two singles after a bunt, or you know, you, someone walks and then you bunt them over, and then you get two timely singles. Oh well, you just kind of got lucky because they were bloopy singles to left field. No, 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 that's the approach. That's what they're trying to do. That is their game plan. That's the philosophy. Now, sometimes a broken bat happens and it ends up going to right field and scoring some runs or that Jankowski play just a couple of days ago, that was absolutely ridiculous. You don't try to break your bat and put it in this soft area, but to me, it just gets so overblown where you got lucky there was a shift. Well, that was a strategic move. What do you mean? If you're throwing the football, if Doug Peterson calls a throwing play and it gets picked off, if you're the defensive team, can you say you got lucky they attempted to throw the ball? They could have easily ran the ball on that play? That is a strategic move that ended up benefiting the other team because you made a decision to move people on one side of the field. When is enough enough? If the pitcher elects to, let's say they, the other team squares a baseball up so there was no luck involved, right? Oh, it wasn't dinky. It wasn't a nothing. It wasn't just a random bloop. It got squared and murdered. Are you technically lucky if, I don't know, Nick Pavetta calls off the catcher and goes with a different pitching sequence and then you hit a home run, but you got lucky. He, he changed the pitch. If he didn't change the pitch, you know what I'm saying? At what point is Luck just going to, oh, well, you just got lucky. Well, you can say that about anything if you just apply it the right way, which is flawed, is flawed. When we're talking about this luck concept, of course. This team is clearly playing a different style. I watched Vinny V put one down. Zach Wheeler put one down. Gene Segura put one down. Jankowski continues to put them down. They're putting down bunts. And, you know, look, that third game against the Marlins, they had plenty of guys on third base but couldn't get that extra one. But I will take my chances. You play the percentage game, you continue to get players on third base, especially how some of the sticks in the lineup have been swinging it. JT Real Muto has been absolutely ridiculous. With with Jankowski's performance as of late, who else is there? When Reese Hoskins take on Andrew McCutcheon's been beautiful with some power number numbers. Gene Segura as well is just providing the the steady Gene, the Gene the scream machine, the Gene the RBI machine, the Gene the hit machine. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore, machine. But the team is playing a different style to it. Analytically, and this is where Dave Dombrowski is somewhat going anti-analytics. Uh, maybe not anti-analytics. That might be strong, but anti the home run strikeout version of it because I'm sure that there's analytics that can support some of the things that they are doing also, right? The strikeouts. You watch teams that go home run strikeout, home run strikeout. You know, you can hit a lot of home runs and still be miserably failing. And while the power has been nice with this Phillies team as of late, 
It's not something that you can heavily rely on as your identity of a team. I think that is what puts you in the ugliness that you saw throughout the first half of the season, why you saw so much up and down and why you saw this emotional roller coaster with their offense. Not only that, and this was brought up during the show, they haven't been able to really be out there altogether. Now, I personally don't put as much stock into that as others. Assessing why this team was disastrous wasn't because of Ronald Torres instead of Didi Gregorius. Now, sure, Bryce Harper missing some time, JT missing time, but Alec Boehm at third base and Reese Hoskins at first base were a big, big reason. Because remember, at the time, Maton was exploding, so he was giving you uh, some of that spark and some of that rise and that charge that the team needed for a little bit of time. You know, there was some ugliness too, but then O'Double was raking and he was going through his moments. There was always something that was carrying this team with a little bit of an emotional rise throughout that time. I looked at Boehm, I looked at Reese, I looked at some of the back end of the starting pitching, and of course the bullpen, and that's the reason why you weren't winning a lot of baseball games. And granted, if you had JT in there earlier and you had Bryce in there without getting hit with a 97-mile-per-hour fastball, of course, you know, you probably have more run support and you'd have a different offense and things might be clicking differently. But still, you lost a lot of baseball games because of other areas of your team that were there that are still crucial parts of your team. So I'm not saying it's all because you didn't have guys available. There were still enough guys available to not lose the way that they were losing. So that's where it leaves a sour taste in my mouth. I like the way they're playing. It's generating a lot of buzz. It's scoring runs. I don't care. I don't care if they're bloop singles and dinky singles up the middle and 0-2 count. Torres pokes one over second base after it passes the pitcher's mound and goes through the pitcher's legs. I don't care. They're trying to attack it that way. Defensive perspective, though, making routine plays, it goes back to what's Alec Bohm's role? If this is the pop that he's going to provide you, which is nothing, and this is the defense he's going to give you, which is nothing, you have to keep thinking about Torres until this 260 batting average ends up dipping to a number that is unacceptable. But, I mean, how do you make that statement to Alec Bohm? Is there a way that you do that? Like, you're telling Alec Bohm you're not good enough right now? I wouldn't have an issue with it. That sports, it's professional sports. He should understand that it's unacceptable to play the defense the way that he does there. But it's also the organization throwing him there. No, it's on him. I mean, he needs to get better. He needs to be stronger in that area, no doubt. But you're also demanding someone who can't play the position to play the position, which makes me feel, you know, some of this is on the franchise as well. But there's nowhere to really play him because I think he's going to be horrendous no matter what. He'll fix the hitting, I believe. I think he'll finally eventually come around with stop putting the ball on the ground. He's consistently hitting the ball on the ground. There's no angle at all. There's nothing going out in the air enough. So, you know, that is a problem. You can turn that around. I don't think there's anywhere you can really turn this defense around. You can tell me first base. I don't believe it, though. And You can say left field, but I think you're drunk and maybe do meth in the bathroom if that's the case because nobody should feel that way about Alec Boom. There's a lot of positive vibes towards DraftKings, though. That's for damn sure. DraftKings Sportsbook is not only my favorite sportsbook, but also America's top-rated sportsbook. I love using DraftKings Sportsbook. It is easy to navigate, has plenty of instructions for new bettors, and nearly limitless ways to get in on all the action. My friends and family love DraftKings Sportsbook, and I know you will too. Listen to this offer. If you download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app right now and use promo code BRODES when you sign up, you will have phenomenal odds boosts and promotions available for you. That is promo code BRODES. Some of these promotions and odds are only for a limited time. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only, new customers only. Restrictions apply in partnership with Meadows Racetrack and Casino. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. So we do have a couple anytime hotline calls to get to, just naturally about the Phillies. Not specifically Dave Dabrowski, but just a couple Phillies phone calls. There's some text messages as well to get to. Uh, just a couple other points that I did write down with some bullets. He praised Ranger Suarez, and he did mention that there's only a few closers better who would be a tremendous upgrade over what we had in, in Ranger Suarez. I, I think that that's not true. I just, I don't have as much hoorah on Ranger Suarez as most. I think right now he's cruising and right now he has confidence. 
you just throw someone into a closer role, though. It's a tough position, and it's hard to demand someone like Ranger Suarez, who just randomly finds his way there and then becomes a, a guy that you can believe in because of just literally a handful on one hand, a handful of opportunities. It's really just not that big of a sample size for me to believe in him forever. But as for right now, I mean, well, he did blow the last one, so I'm waiting to see how he faces adversity and what he's going to be like tech, taking strides forward. I'm just not as confident as everybody else seems to be on Ranger, even though he's had some big moments and he's gotten out of some big outs. And there's been bases loaded. Ranger Suarez comes in, dices through the lineup, and the Phillies escape with maybe only one run or allow zero runs. Like, he's been tremendous at times, for sure. Dabrowski also touched on how the bullpen was upgraded this year, but not performing at a high level as we hoped they were going to before the season began. So, you know, just uh, just a few things to kind of look at with this conversation with John Clark that I did find pretty fascinating. All right, let's fly on over to the Anytime Hotline and hear what you have to say about the Phelps. Hey, this is Tim in Baltimore. I just wanted to say, love the show. I've been watching uh, kind of, you know, coffee and all that starts my day off on the good uh, note there. Just wanted to say Jankowski is everything I wanted Roman Quinn to be. He's electrifying the way he can steal bases, the way he can beat the throw to first base when he bunts. Um, just wanted to get your reaction to that because he seems like he's so much more than uh, of a complete ball player than Roman Quinn at this point in their careers. Well, first off, thank you so much for all the kind words. I really do appreciate the love and support from everybody, but thank you so much for taking your time to call in and, and stress how you feel about coffee with Broads in the morning and how that starts your day. Uh, it starts my day as well, and there's nothing better than having my cup of joe in the morning, hitting the chat room with everybody, and, and hanging out, talking about what happened that night previously and what's going to happen you know, that specific day as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. And then in terms of Jankowski, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's honestly a very similar way of playing. Aggressive, speedy, passed, forces you to make mistakes. You know, running down the line as hard as possible is definitely forcing other teams to make maybe rush their throws, make errors, keeping in, innings alive, butting the ball, doing all the little things. I, I do think that that is extremely important, and I just never thought about it with Roman Quinn, but now that you brought that up, and I saw something earlier, and I wanted to, I was going to bring it up on my computer, but I believe I texted it to a buddy, so I want to bring this up, and it's about Jankowski, that's why I mentioned it. Okay, here we go. Tran Travis Jankowski, 33 games, and this is what he's slashing. 375, 474, 500. Nine walks, eight strikeouts. Not too bad for Jankowski. Now, it's not the most attempts in the world. We can't be comparing it to other individuals who have way more at-bats and way more opportunities. But for this tiny spurt, you know, and that's why I talk about how where this team was when players were injured. And you can say, well, one of the reasons why they weren't as smooth is because they were injured. And sure, there's something to that. But we talk about these little plug-and-play guys. And while I don't love the fact that maybe they play more than they do, a lot of that has to do with players not being available. A lot of that has to do with just your roster and where it is also. But Nick Maton stepped in, big role. You didn't have a lot at center field, but Odubel Herrera came in and he filled the void for a little bit and then he went pretty cold again. Jankowski, Ronald Torres, you know, these players who have been bench pieces, role pieces, and then needed to provide maybe a little bit of longevity there while waiting for somebody to get their number called again. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've definitely been in that area. And Roman Quinn, he's been so out of sight, out of mind. I honestly forgot about Roman Quinn. And now that I'm thinking about it, I do remember the injury that happened, how brutal it was running to home. He still scored that run, so I forgot how brutal and, and disturbing that injury really was to watch, and I hope he recovers from it, of course. But yeah, ew, ugh. but I forgot about Roman Quinn. You're right, though. Jankowski has basically been what you probably expected out of Roman Quinn. 
almost the perfect day for the Phillies. You, you swept the doubleheader from the Marlins, if you want to call it a doubleheader. You win another series. Hector Neris gets back on the beam. Nobody happier than Hector Neris, who may be back in the closer's role after his last couple performances. If not for the gagging of the Pittsburgh Pirates, it would have been a perfect day. But then again, they were lucky to win the night before. So solid win for the Phillies on to New York. Hopefully Aaron Nola coming off the COVID list and getting the start off the All-Star break will pitch the way he's capable of. They're going to need him down the stretch. Oh, no doubt. He's going to have to have a monster second half and really help this baseball club out. Good August, scary Septembers. So we'll see as we inch our way closer. Right now it is July 19th. So I'm interested to see how the bullpen lines up moving forward. You don't know what's going to happen night in and night out. Who's going to be available? Who's not? Who's going to close the game? Is it Rangers? Is it Hector? Hector has had six appearances without being a dumpster fire. So eventually when a closer seems to find some rhythm and cruise, especially someone who has the background that Hector Neris has. And yes, that is correct. He has had saves in the past and he has had many gr- good, really strong moments where he's delivered for this baseball team. So that has been the case. Maybe it's a combination of both. If Ranger can go that night, they go to Ranger. If you're feeling Hector Neris that night, maybe you go to Hector Neris. You know, I'm not telling you that Hector is never going to blow a save again because I guarantee it. I'll put the mortgage down that he does blow a save again. But who knows? I just know that he's done it a billion times before and has the track record when he's not in a horrendous rut, which players like Chapman get into, as you see, with the yips, if you will, that he's had over this recent stretch and hasn't been maybe the the smoothest. Although the Yankees are starting to win some baseball games. You know, there's been some some ugly ones out of Chapman. It's just the nature of the beast and the nature of the position. So, all right, Joe, ball's in your court. Let's see how you control everything and how you manage when the games get a bit more intense and when the division is on the line. I got to give Joe some credit, though. I think he's been making better moves as of late, and he has been pushing the right button. So if that continues along with the team playing better baseball, who knows where that leads them. All right, last year, we do have a message from Keith, and Keith asks about, I thought I remembered it because it was real quick, that text message, but, oh, Bryce Harper, that's right, it is right here. Am I underwhelmed with Bryce Harper? And I feel after every couple, I was going to say every couple months, but that's too long. Every couple weeks, there's that Bryce Harper, Bryce Harper's not doing enough. And then there's a couple weeks where Bryce Harper goes on a stretch and it's, wow, Bryce Harper's just playing magnificent baseball and he's hitting 390 in the last two weeks and he's putting together six home runs and he just really is a elite player at that point. With Bryce Harper, though, am I underwhelmed with him? No, I'm not underwhelmed with him. I'm not at all. Let's pull up his stats just so we can. I I typed in Bryce stats. Okay, well, I realized that I was talking about Bryce Harper, probably because I've done it before. Right now, he's hitting 283 with 15 home runs. Would I like for him to have more than 15 home runs right now? Yeah, but keep in mind, he was hurt, and then he gets hit in the wrist with the fastball, and the wrist wasn't the same, and then there was the back problem with how heavy his swing was. He's had a lot of lingering issues, so with his 71 games to this point, having 15 numbers, I would like the power number to be more, yes. Right now, his OPS is 900. He's slugging 519, 519, with a 283 batting average. His RBIs are low, but that's more of a product of what's happening in front of him more than it is what's happening with him himself. And there's been a lot of times that he's generated that offense. I talked about small ball. Walks gets on first base. What do you know? Here comes Reese Hoskins. Here comes Didi Gregorius. Here comes some of that small ball. Here comes Andrew McCutcheon, who's no longer leading in the bat off, the leadoff spot, batting leadoff. And now he's providing something for you a little bit deeper into your batting order. And what do you know? Like Bryce Harper is starting this, and Bryce Harper is – doing minor things, earning a walk, a tough at-bat, six-pitch at-bat, and he he works it, he earns it, he takes close pitches, he recognizes the strike zone, he makes it tough for the opponent. Sometimes it's him starting it, and then the others have to finish, and they have been recently. So to answer your question, Keith, no, I am not underwhelmed with Bryce Harper. 
With that being said, I want to thank you all so much. I can't wait for this Yankees series. I'm so fucking pumped. You have a two-game set in New York. A sweep would be insane. A split would be more realistic, and I'd be okay with that. Of course, context matters. If you win game one and then you blow the lead in game two after being up nine to two, and it's the seventh inning and your bullpen explodes, no, I'm not going to be happy. That means you let one slip and you could have came out with two and you only came out with one. You you hurt yourself, okay? You did damage to me, and you did damage to yourself. So that would be totally unacceptable. We'll see. I'm excited. I can't wait. Yankees are playing good baseball. Phillies are playing good baseball. Something has to give. Thank you all so much, and I will see you next time.